These are the diehards that are here today. If you stay till Friday, you really care about logistics. I was getting a pep talk backstage by the Loa staff, and they've really embraced General Minahan's message, and they said, sir, don't suck. And I said, OK, challenge accepted. Uh, so please roll the video. Now, I'm not sure how that video made you feel. I mean, it had some pretty inspirational moments in it. The music was soothing. It reminded you back of 1984, where it was Reagan's uh, campaign video that said, uh, Morning in America. But one thing that you need to realize in that video that should motivate you and inspire you is when that munition was dropped, it wasn't dropped on an arbitrary target. It was dropped on Anderson. That is a satellite image of Anderson that is superimposed next to the video of where that munition was dropped. This is a commercial that's put out by the People's Liberation Army and Air Force in China to recruit into their armed forces and to speak to their population about the capability they have. The title of the video is The God of War, H6K, Goes on the Attack. They are deliberate about the messaging they are sending their people and about what they're doing. And it makes it very clear to us why mission generation is under attack and why we have to be focused in everything we do, especially within the logistics enterprise, to prepare for what is coming. And how we do that depends on how we train. The 82nd Training Wing is the largest technical training wing in the United States Air Force. 48% of those airmen that graduate from basic military training out of the 50 or 52 weeks a year come to Shepard. And all those AFSCs that you heard when they talked about uh, what I do at Shepard. And I think people underestimate the impact that we have in training, and especially within the logistics enterprise. Almost 65,000 technical training graduates that we have, that we train in 63 locations around the world. This is a massive operation and enterprise that we have. I will liken it to this. We are the epicenter of a sonic boom. We send out every week over 200 graduates to bases across the world. If we get it right, 
we get it right for the United States Air Force. If we don't, we make it harder. And so what we do every single day is integral to ensuring that we accelerate the change that the chief talks about so we don't lose. And that's why we need to stay focused on training and why it's important to our airmen and to the next generation. Because that next generation is different than we were. The students that graduated high school in 2021 are the first individuals that graduate as technical natives. They grew up when the iPhone came about in 2007 in their hand when they were youngsters. So they know the world in a different way than most of us know it. They've had access to unfettered information. And throughout that time, they have had the ability to comprehend the world in a much different way than many of us had. When I grew up and I had to write a paper in high school, like many in the audience, you went to the library, you started with the encyclopedia, then you went to the card catalog and the Dewey Decimal System, and then you pulled all that stuff out and took notes on note cards, and then you went to the typewriter and whiteout, and you did all those things. Then you carried that book bag that probably put stress and strain on your material and began your disability rating. <laughs> but today, they don't have that. They have Chromebooks and Google Classroom. That is what they understand training to be. In China today, computer science and AI training is mandated for all their students. We only have three states in the United States that mandate computer science training. So they are accelerating their understanding of what STEM is and how they train their next generation. And so our private sector has accelerated where we have stood still and we can do better. This is a somber slide, and this is the reality of where a lot of tech training is today. That trainer that you see there is a 1962 model of a C-130. And up to a year ago, we were training your airmen on how to be avionics technicians on that trainer. And what we had done as the next step was use our acquisition system to acquire new hard trainers. It was 10 years going. We had produced nothing. It was going to be late, and it already had 100 deficiencies. And so to the credit of our group commander out there, Colonel Dan Lemon, he said, we got to stop this craziness. And so he reprogrammed the money that was left and invested it in technology to accelerate the training we needed to do. The training device that most airmen see at Shepard Air Force Base is not an electronic device. It's a three-ring notebook where all their material is in, and we issue them that. And what's even crazier is today at basic military training, those trainees that come in from all parts of America, you know what they get? They get a CAC-enabled iPad. And all their stuff that they do at BMT is on that. When they graduate, what happens? We take that CAC-enabled iPad away from them. And what do we give them? A three-ring binder. That's their training device. We regress them in everything they have known from the time they have been born. And then we couple that with the infrastructure challenges that we not only have Shepard, but around the world. The hangar you see there was built in 1941 and has trained hundreds of thousands of airmen. It was a model of innov innovation back in the early 40s. Now, it is a challenge to maintain. We're gonna spend $20, 20, sorry, $20 million to upgrade that hangar, and all we'll do is put a new fire suppression system, HVAC system, the guts of the building, but it will look no different. And the classroom you see there is how we've tried to introduce technology by spiraling extension cords everywhere. I have more ground safety write-ups than anyone in the United States Air Force, and you know what? I'm proud of it, write me up. Because the only way we're gonna accelerate is if we take a little risk. The most risk in that classroom right now is they're gonna trip over that cord, and I can live with that risk. But we need to do better. For decades, for decades, tech training has been underfunded. 
because we in this room have not banged on our high chairs loud enough to get the attention of the United States Air Force. You need to be demanding customers of the product that we produce. And if we just assume what was good yesterday will allow us to win today, that is a false proposition. We owe our airmen better. We have the capability because we've shown how we can be better. And it starts with what we do in training. We have to get left of that bang. Now, with all that being said, there's tremendous work happening throughout AETC, 2nd Air Force and the 82nd, to accelerate that change. General Robinson, the AETC commander, when he put out his strategic plan a few months ago, made the deliberate statement in one of his lines of effort that we are going to pivot to tech training transformation. This is the first time that an AETC commander has uttered the words tech training in decades. They love talking about 19th Air Force and undergraduate pilot training. And we have given over the past five years in 2nd Air Force about $2 billion of our budget to resource 19th Air Force, which was important at the time, but there's an opportunity cost to that that we have, to, that we have paid. And so I tell you today that there is hope on the horizon because the leadership within AETC have, has caught the attention of those around them to ensure that we're going to get resources to begin a tipping point in tech training. As you see there, that's the money that's coming to Second Air Force over the next two fiscal years. And we've been using a corporate process that the Air Force holds true to understand what are the priorities, because if we don't execute this right over the next two years, there is no hope we'll get more money. And by the way, that money right there, a little over $100 million, is budget dust in the grand scheme of our United States Air Force. So we have to show that we execute this well to win the trust and confidence of those not only in AETC, but in the building. Because when you think of the corporate process and you put tech training on a slide, those folks in A8, who we love very well, will delete that very easily for another B-21 or F-35. So we have to make a compelling argument about why training is important and compelling to our United States Air Force. And so again, we need your help in your formations. You should be demanding of us the best trained airmen. Today, we have airmen that show up to your formations and we take feedback from them after they graduate and their supervisors. And the biggest feedback we get is this, thank you for the training, but you did not train me on the aircraft that I'm working on today. You trained me on something that was decades older that didn't have the modifications of what I'm seeing out today. So we're putting a burden on the operational units to train them again on the thing we should have done back at tech training. We have a ground instructional training aircraft ramp out there at tech training. It is a heritage ramp. Come to my heritage ramp, I'll give you a tour. It'll, it'll, it has older aircraft than probably the Air Force Museum. So we have to find better ways to do what we need to do. And we're, what we're going to talk about next is how 2nd Air Force is moving that forward. So to the credit of General Edmondson and her team, they have thoughtfully approached how we're going to transform technical training and create a sixth generation learning environment. Because if we're going to ask our airmen to maintain and sustain fifth generation technology, you need to step up your game in training and have a sixth generation learning environment. And I'll start at the beginning and move around the wheel. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. It's a utility, not a luxury. It's on Maslow's hierarchy. Food, shelter, Wi-Fi. <laughs> As of today, because that was the promise made, all the classrooms and student dorms at Shepherd will have Wi-Fi. It will be the only technical wing in 2nd Air Force that has Wi-Fi. It has been a battle for the last two years to get Wi-Fi. I did it in the opposition of the AETC A36, who said, we have a solution. It's called Awaken. It's gonna take eight years and $48 million. I said, sorry, we're not gonna do that. And so we said no, and we went with a commercial provider. And how much did it cost? $6.5 million. 
I'll take that cost any day than waiting eight years for the solution that, that's late to need. It's not even going to be called Wi-Fi in eight years. I don't even know what we're talking about. And so we're excited about introducing that, because if you don't have that foundational capability, right, every technical college in America has Wi-Fi. Every college in America has Wi-Fi. We were reticent to have Wi-Fi. You know why? I'm going to say something that you don't want to hear. We didn't want to put Wi-Fi in the student dorms. You know why? They said they're just going to surf porn. That's ridiculous. You can protect the system. But we were making excuses for not doing what we accept in our daily lives as the obvious. So today we have Wi-Fi. And now with that, we can move on to modernize our classrooms. We can introduce technology. So now we're introducing tablets to our students so they can continue what they had in their learning environments back in their hometowns to what they got at BMT to now what will they'll, they'll see in the classroom. And so we're creating spaces that speak to the environments they were in, not the rank and file teaching where the instructor drones on for six hours a day in front of them with PowerPoint, right? That is not how you engage a digital native. You need to meet them where they're at. You need to understand how they grew up. And so we're beginning to reshape our classrooms so they understand that we're listening to where they came from and where they need to be. Infrastructure, mentioned that already. The hangars that we have also serve as classrooms. And in those classrooms, we don't have enough power receptacles to plug in everything I've just talked about. We have enough power receptacles to plug in an overhead projector because that's what it was made for. And so we have a big wedge of funding we're asking for to put power into the classrooms so they can charge these tablets. And, the, and one of the things we're going to talk about, which is not foreign at all, because we were selling the hell out of it out in the floor over there, which is ARVR. And so how can you sell it to us if we don't even have the power to charge it? So we're working on our infrastructure, learning delivery. We're introducing technology. ARVR is one of those things where now you can load all the content that they would do on a tactile trainer. They can take it back to their dorm now because they have Wi-Fi, and they can practice tasks hundreds of times so that they can have the confidence and the competence when they get there to still do the tactile test of understanding how to manage that particular uh, problem set, but they can learn it in an environment that they're used to. Digital natives that play World of Warcraft every single day, right? Why don't we meet them where they're at? So we're excited about introducing that. Human performance. We talk about it a lot. The resiliency panel spoke deeply about how human performance is important. So at Shepherd today, you know, we still do PT three times a week in formations of five or 600. Do you know how useful that is? It is not. It makes us feel good because we did PT with five or 600 people. Would you join a gym where your group exercise class was five or 600 people? No, you would not do that. You'd go to another gym or just work out on your own and get the Peloton app or something like that, right? So we're taking one of our squadrons, the 365, uh, it, they do the avionics training, six, 600 students for about six months, and we're gonna reimagine how to do fitness. Because if they, if they learn how to do it right there, when they get to your formations, they will be healthier, and then they can take that lesson with them out there. We're going to break them up in small groups and not just teach them about PT, but we're going to talk to them about sleep hygiene, about eating, about emotional intelligence, all those things that fit into the things that we know when they don't go right, they come back as a tsunami of things that commanders and leaders have to deal with. And so we're really excited about what we can do in that space. Faculty development. We were doing zero faculty development at Shepherd. Around America today in the K through 12 or college system, they take faculty down days to enrich their faculty. So now every quarter, we have faculty down days to help them understand these new learning modalities, the technology that's out there, because we have some seasoned instructors out there that may be a little reticent to change. And so if we don't invest in them, it will be more difficult to get them on board. So we have to show that as much as we invest in our students, we invest in our faculty. And while the faculty is being enriched, we pull our airmen in training out of that technical training for that day, and they get life skills training on emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, 
relationship management. And so we're trying to balance that within the time that we have. Resourcing models, I spoke it again uh, earlier about how we're using the Air Force corporate process to understand how we're modeling and understanding our priorities and speaking them not only within our own command but to the Air Force corporate structure so they understand the compelling need for the resourcing that we request. And then finally, learning architecture, which is on the far end of the, of the wheel there, we need to find a way to have an environment where all the materials hung in one spot, they can access it not only while they're in training, but also once they graduate. Many courses that you take today, that material is available after you graduate. Why could that not be the same case when you graduate tech school? So you can reference that back. You may have seen some of our teammates out there today or over the last few days that were talking about the innovations they had. And one that was just introduced to me that was just mind blowing but yet so obvious is one of our master sergeants that's in our crew chief course. What was he doing? He was using chat GPT, loaded all the fundamental crew chief material on it so that airmen then can ask questions and give them an answer back to something they may not have understood in the curriculum they received. And so it reformats it and synthesizes that through AI. And then I said, well, maybe if I don't understand it that way, what happens if they need a more fundamental understanding? And they told that AI program, they said, explain it to me like I'm a child. And it came back in the most fundamental way to understand in the example I saw of how does a prop work. It's amazing. That's what airmen want. They want that on their device so they can use it just like they use it anywhere else. Now, with all that being said, we have made some advancements at Shepard that we're really excited about. Once again, every single day, more and more airmen in training receive a device. In our crew chief course, as an example, it's our largest pipeline, 800 students, 16 students in a class. A class starts every day. It's a fast moving deal with 24 uh, training days in there. And right now, every crew chief gets a tablet. Two classes are going through as beta tests with AR, VR. By the way, we're issuing them AR, VR headsets that are worth about $2,000 a piece, which scares a few people in a reporter survey. What are they going to do? But you know what? They protect that device. They love that device. They don't throw their phones around, and they're not going to throw an AR, VR headset around. So they can take that to class. They can take it home. The most bizarre thing that I saw is in a crew chief class where they're testing this, they gave a lesson. And then they put these airmen in an open hangar bay, and they're all standing there with their AR, VR spread apart doing this. And it's like, what are we doing? But this is, they love it. They think it's amazing. The center pictorial there shows what we reprogrammed that hard trainer money into, which was a virtual maintenance aircraft trainer. They reimagined that classroom, did a lot of self-help, $20,000 of it. And that classroom does not look like the classroom we grew up in. That's a classroom they want to be in. That's a classroom they're going to learn in. That's a classroom they're going to excel in. And so we're really excited about that. And then finally, you see a crew chief there as she's uh, beginning and testing out AR, VR to understand how to do her job. We have a lot of people, believe it or not, that enter tech training that they have never touched a tool in their life. They come from places around the world and in America that they just didn't touch tools. They were not mechanically inclined. So any chance we have then to put them in an environment that makes them comfortable to be able to repeat the reps and sets of what they're learning is amazing. And the feedback we're getting is that their retention of material is about 35% greater by using that than just getting instruction-led lecture every single day and then sitting there, taking a PC, and then moving on, core dumping that, and going on to the next topic. And so we're seeing a lot of educational outcomes that are positive as a result of doing this. So we are excited, but this is a small portion. Once again, a thousand courses, 55 different pipelines. I've only talked about a half a dozen here that we're doing that on. So there's a lot of opportunity yet to be explored. All advancement in training does not cost money. And I give credit to our Air Force Logistics Officer School that trains our aircraft maintenance logistics readiness and munitions officers. Everything you see there did not cost a dime. 
And through the great collaboration that we have with Half A4L, Bill Maxwell and his team, they have reimagined what officer training is in the logistics enterprise. They talk about conflict resolution. They talk about emotional intelligence. They talk about time management. They talk about taking risk. When I was in AMOC, we didn't talk about taking risks. We talked about follow the TO, follow the TO, follow the TO. We didn't talk about thinking outside the box. They use game, gamification. They do escape rooms. They do Kingfish Ace to understand what Ace is about. And so this is revolutionary, and this is what you can do in any classroom at zero cost. And so I encourage you to talk to your young lieutenants that are coming out of our schoolhouse and get their feedback and see how they're engaging you in their workspaces now based on this training. I think this is the most revolutionary thing that we've done in tech training in decades. And this is an example that we need to follow in our en enlisted skills training. It is possible to do it there. We just have to take this to scale and make it happen. Now, all of this is great, and there's no sound to this purposely, but we've put out some amazing commercials to entice and encourage people to join our United States Air Force. The Chief of Staff visited Shepard Air Force Base a few months ago, and we had some time on the story with him, and I said, Chief, I've got some feedback. All your commercials show the vast majority of people are going to be F-35 pilots or special tactics officers. And guess what? I've been in Second Air Force long enough to know there's plenty of people lined outside the door to be a pilot and a special tactics officer. What we need to show in there is more of what we're seeing here is the skilled labor career fields that we know we need to recruit to because those are the ones that are getting pulled into the private sector. The reason we have a shortage is we don't, it's not because we don't have enough pilots or enough special tactics officers. Right now, we have a 10% deficit in those that we're recruiting because we're not getting them into the things that we do every single day. And so what we need to do is all that technology that we see there, that is not what they see at tech training. We need to ensure that we can continue the promise in that commercial with what the recruiter says and what got them to walk in the door. And so I think that's incumbent upon us to ensure that we are diligent and dedicated to ensuring that our Air Force understands the needs that we have, because training is seminal to what we do. As you all know in this audience, when training goes south, you're spending a lot of time answering questions and redoing things that could have been done right the first time. And we have the promise to give you the world's best trained airmen, but we can only do that with your feedback. Now, everybody in this room is a Shepherd alum or an antecedent. If you didn't go to Shepherd, you went to some place that has a Shepherd thing to it. By the way, we're going to hand out stickers with a QR code on the back, and it's to join our alumni association. Dues are, dues are $25 a year. You get a patch every year if you sign up. We're trying to raise more money so we can fix that, fix that stuff I talked about. But this is what we need to be. I think we're too passive. You know, we talk about being bold and creative and innovative until it matters, and then we're not. Everybody in this room works for a MAGCOM commander. Wouldn't it be powerful if at Corona, it wasn't just the AETC commander talking about the necessity of accelerating change in tech training, but that the ACC commander said it, the AMC commander said it, the AFSOC commander said it. The Global Strike Commander came up to my boss, General Boussier, and he said, tax me. Tax me so that I can provide you the resources you need to do it. So it won't happen internally to AETC. We need to support those that are out there. It needs to come from those MAGCOMs that we deliver that combat capability to. So we got stickers to hand out. I want you to give this sticker to your MAGCOM commander. Someone be brave enough. Give your sticker, give this to them, the QR code. You know, we got a Venmo site there. We'll take as much money as they got. He's handing out stickers right back there. He's shameless. He's shameless. He's going to get step promoted right now as soon as he did that. So we're excited. We're excited about what we do. Sometimes I hear when someone gets an assignment to go to Shepherd, there's like this this malaise that comes over them, this like, oh, foreboding thing. If, if you are uncertain about getting an assignment to Shepard and that's going to ruin your career, 
think, I mean, the, the talent we bring in there into Aflos is absolutely incredible. They're here. They know. Our squadron commanders are just as good as any other squadron commanders out there. Our top three squadron commanders, you know where they're going to go? They're going to go to IDE or SDE in residence. Two of the three of them that are SDE eligible, you know where they're going? National War College. We just don't send anyone to National War College, right? And so if you perform, you will be, you will be taken care of no matter where you go. It doesn't have to just be the first fighter wing. It can be the 82nd training wing. And so we encourage you to send your best and brightest, not only our officers, but your enlisted, to instruct and to be military training leaders. Another aspect, MTIs are at basic, MTLs are in tech training, and they help nurture and develop those airmen as they continue to learn what it's like to be an airman in our United States Air Force. And so you have that choice every single day through the DSD process of who you nominate. I've been in that seat before. Sometimes you're like, well, I need this guy to be an expediter or pro super. That's my number one person. Sometimes you got to send your best and brightest to the beginning, to where it all starts, to where the sonic boom begins. Because if we get it right here, we get it right for the United States Air Force. A few years ago, I went to my high school reunion, and the high school quarterback walked in. And back in 1990, a long time ago, we won the state championship for football. And that was a big deal because we hadn't won it for decades. And that was a buzz. I mean, the town, you come from small town America anywhere, even up in Massachusetts, we love us some football. And everyone was excited to see him again. You know what? And he even came with his letterman jacket on. Now, it was a little tighter <laughs> than what it used to be, right? He wasn't as sleek or svelte as he used to be. He came in, and they're reliving that for a few moments over drinks about the big game and that game-winning pass that he made to win the state championship, right? And then they said, well, what are you doing now? And there was an awkward silence in the room. So we've been Super Bowl champs since 1947. That doesn't mean we're going to be Super Bowl champs again next year or the year after. We cannot live on the success of the past and just assume because we've won, we're going to continue to win. We have to invest in what's important, and that's our most important weapon system, our airmen. And you do that by investing in training, by putting the right resources and the right people in that enterprise. And that's why we would love to have you join Team Shepard. Even the Navy. We have Navy out, Team Shep. We love, we bring you. I love, you know, I love these guys. They have, they have owned it since they've been here. They don't care if that says G-O-S-C-S -S seating. They have taken that table all week. I love it. I love it. Would we do the same in their, in, in, in their environment? I don't know. But I give them props for doing that. So what we need to do is we've won before. We know we can win again, but you cannot live off of the past. You have to be ready for tomorrow. At Shepard, we train the world's best airmen by defending America's future one graduate at a time. We are very proud of that. But the only way we're going to do it is with you. We need your help. We need your advocacy. We need your best and brightest to come and join us on this endeavor because we can do this together. That's how we will accelerate change so we don't lose. Another QR code. There's a lot of them floating around here. I promise there's only like two or three questions on here. I want you to provide us feedback, and I don't want it to be kind. Light me up. Tell me what we need to do better. The only way we do that is through feedback. A friend of mine who's a retired Army colonel, he said, feedback is a gift that you must give often. And sometimes you may not want to receive it, but it's necessary. So I ask you to help us be better, because I know together we can do this. That commercial at the beginning should inspire you to want to do more. They talk about every day about what it is to win, and they talk about going after our blood and treasure. And so what are we going to do to respond? Are we going to wait until we get kicked in the face and then be better? Or are we going to do it so they can never think about doing anything that attracts our attention? The world is a different place than it was many years ago. But we have to understand what that change is. And together we can do it by training the world's best airmen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.